Hi there, I'm Ishan Mani, president of the I Write Youth Club. And today I am super excited to chat with Ms. Gabriella Buba in the latest installment of the I Write Exclusive Author Series. Gabriella is a writer and chemical engineer by trade from our very own city of Houston, Texas. Her debut novel, Saints of Storm and Sorrow, will be published on June 25th, 2024. It's an adult novel which follows the journey of Luna Rin, a mestiza storm caller who's hiding from the Inquisition, which brands her as a witch, and the goddess of storms who sings of drowning colonizers. When she's discovered, a marriage of convenience might save her from the church, but not from her goddess. There is a lot at risk here. She fears the typhoon brewing within her will destroy the violent colonizers, but also the family she found in the convent and her new marriage. Very, very interesting, a superb work of Filipino mythology, something we very rarely get to see. So very excited for this. Thank you so much, Ms. Buba, for chatting with me today. And let's dive right into it. All righty. So we can start with um, this line that I saw on your website. I keep things writing the edge of the explosive limit. I love that so much, also because it fits really well with the chemical engineering angle and all of the all the things that you do. So how does that line translate into all your writing, whether it's Saints of Storm and Sorrow or your short works? Let's see. I love that line, first of all, because it's kind of a chemical engineering pun. Um, I'm, I work in the oil field, so I work with a lot of pressure vessels full of uh, natural gas and oil, which are, of course, uh, explosive. <laughs> so for my, it's a, it's a nod to the day job. Um, but also, I really love stories that, that are no holds barred, that like what anything that could happen does happen. So like, if there's that, you know, they call it like, um, Chekhov's gun on the table, the gun will right. explode in my stories. <laughs> There's no, oh, no, no, we're going to hold back from that. We're going to be good people. No, none of that. <laughs> I'm here for, I'm here to watch everything go wrong. <laughs> That's a really valuable thing for, for an author to have, though. Like, a lot of people are like, I don't want to kill my darlings. I don't want, I want to, I want to save everything. You're like, watch it all burn, basically, which is, which is amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> a great impulse to have, honestly. That's awesome. So, uh, just a couple of days back, you got this, the, the, the release of this amazing news that your uh, new book, Saints of Storm and Sorrow, is picked up by Titan Books, uh, UK, I think, right? And it's coming yes. in June of 2024. So um, tell me more about how you got the idea for the book in the first place. It's pretty interesting. I mean, it's a mestiza storm caller forced into this kind of like marriage uh, of, of, of convenience and how she has to navigate that whole thing. So tell me more about how you got that idea. Absolutely. So um, the inspiration was kind of twofold. Um, I've been trying to write this story for about a decade. And the original version of the story, you wouldn't recognize at all because it was a pseudo European fantasy. Because at that point in my writing career, I didn't understand that I could write people that looked like me. And over the years, I've revised and revised. And when I finally had that breakthrough that the reason the story wasn't working was because they were all Filipino. Everything clicked into place. Like the story became so much more. Um, and part of that was I stumbled across this article about the oldest um, existing black Madonna in the Philippines. So the oldest wood carving of a, of a St. Mary statue. Um, and it's actually not a St. Mary statue. Actually, the Spaniards discovered this existing, um, they're called Anito idols and it's the idols of the old Diwata from before the um, colonization. Um, and they found her on a beach, people were making offerings, they picked her up, they put her in the church and said, that's Mother Mary. It's Mother Mary and you're all Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, and, and we don't know anymore who that goddess was or what her name was or anything like that or any of the rituals that were done for her. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that made her angry. I wonder if being renamed and put in a church to other gods and being like downgraded from a goddess to a saint, I wonder if that made her angry. That is so cool. And that was kind of the seed that started this whole story because it's it's very much based on the early 
um, shaman and um, the priestesses and, and shamans of the Philippines are called Catalonan. And, and those early rebellions against the Spanish uh, colonialism were often led by those spiritual leaders. Um, and so I took a bunch of those like, uh, I guess, folk tales about like their powers and their abilities. And I said, okay, what if, <laughs> what if it happened? That's what if she amazing. was angry and what if it happened? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> super also because like I'm a massive mythology guy, but I've never I just have never come across Filipino mythology. I mean, you we focus on I mean, of course there's Greek, Roman, there's Norse. Um you get some Asian cultures, you get some like Aztec stuff, but you don't really get Filipino mythology. So, I mean, my next question is what was the research process like for that? Um did you have to do a lot of digging? It was a lot of digging, actually. So um, a lot of what we have is actually, um, we don't have primary sources really anymore. There's very few um, existing written material in like pre-Spanish contact um, languages. A lot of it was destroyed or uh, it, it just didn't survive the same way other areas did. Um, so a lot of it was reading either Spanish sources or um, um, other different folks who came to the Philippines very early and reading their uh, original sources of what happened. I was actually at some point, so I, I read Spanish a bit in okay. my day job. I We interact in Spanish a lot verbally, but my reading skills are not like a old Spanish, B old yeah. academic level Spanish. So I'm sitting there between Google Translate and <laughs> and like my fifth grade level reading Spanish, <laughs> and I'm dissecting like Spanish friars' accounts of like early worship practices of the uh, Tagalogs oh, wow. and like lowland Philippine cultures. So there was a lot. I, I contacted. Um, um, some professors in the Philippines to kind of talk about their work and and got a lot of different books on mythology. Um, the Philippines really hasn't, you're right, it hasn't gotten the same international attention to our mythologies um, as some other cultures have. And, and I'd really like to be part of changing that. Um, uh, part of the, another part of what inspired this story was um, my grandmother used to tell me like the Tagalog creation story. And I kind of, I reimagined it in kind of, um, I guess, a feminist retelling. Yeah. So I reimagined a feminist retelling of that creation story as kind of the seed for the magic system and pantheon of the uh, novel of Saints of Storm and Sorrow. That is very cool. I'm now going to end up having to do like a huge deep dive on Filipino mythology. So on my reading list. Um, oh, you should check out... Um, a good one in English that's like a great starting point is the Aswang project. Okay. Really good starting point. Awesome. I will I will definitely check that out. So in the midst of like all this, like you were digging up some primary sources, working on some secondary sources, and there's also your identity as a biracial Filipino Asian American that kind of comes in. How did you cultivate a voice for the main character, Luna Rin, in the middle of all of this mythological background and everything? Wow. Um, hmm. I will say Lenora is very, a lot of authors like say, oh, my characters, they aren't based on me. Um, I'm not that author. I take <laughs> like a really tiny crystallized chunk of feeling that I'm like chewing on and I stick it in my character and I let them like go absolutely nuts with it. So like, Lunurin's made up a lot of what like struggling to reconnect with my Filipino roots felt like and, and feeling like you're pulled between two worlds and and maybe neither of them really want you. Mm. <laughs> which which as, as a multiracial kid, yeah. it as, as you grow into adulthood, you like you come to a whole new interaction with your identities, I think, than you had as a kid. Like as a kid you're really embedded in the culture. We were raised, um, my grandparents lived with us growing up, my Filipino grandparents. So the food, the language, it's all around you. But then, you know, you move out or those family members pass away and your connection to your identity becomes thinner and thinner. And you start thinking, well, what am I? Who am I in the absence of my family? 
Um, and I think that's what really sparked a lot of me using my art and my writing to dig back into my identity and to realize that doing so made my art so much more impactful and, and meaningful to me. And, and I hope to others, obviously, yeah. um, it's a very unique perspective, definitely an Asian American perspective. I, I really don't claim to be like the most authentic mainland Filipino voice, but but I do think that I have something to say, and I'd rather that I say it rather than some white person come along and write it for us. Fair enough. Fair enough. That is that is very fair. Yeah, and and that is that's uh, it's true. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm not biracial. I'm Indian American. So even in that situation, there's two cultures, and you know, I've talked about this with my friends too, who have who share a similar background. It's like you're kind of being pulled apart, and it's finding finding which sphere. Uh, uh, it's almost like sliders, right? You're like dialing up and dialing down, which which part of you uh, shows up more. Uh, but it's just finding that that place in the world. So I love that. I love that a lot. Um, and in general, I know that the, the book has some themes of religion. And um, in Filipino culture, even today, religion plays a, a, a huge theme in life. Um, and I'm sure with mythology, it does as well. So tell me more about how that factors in as a theme, um, how you've seen it in your own life, anything. Absolutely. Um, so I, I don't know if, it's, you know if you know this, but like the Philippines is like, I don't know what the exact percentage was, but the one sticking in my head is something like 90% Catholic, like just oh, wow. very, very Catholic, which is pretty rare for an Asian country. Like the Spanish colonization efforts were in at least Luzon and like the Northern Philippines, there is um, a, a very strong Muslim culture in the Southern Philippines and Mindanao. And I don't want to erase that, but but in the Northern Philippines where like the Spanish stronghold was, um, the friars were very successful in, in conversion and really stamping out that all the pre-colonial religions. Um, and I wouldn't say stamping out though, I'd say like what happened in a lot of South American cultures where you have that blending of what there was before with um with Catholicism you end up with that um that secretism so you end up with a lot of those pre-colonial traditions seeping through the uh the Catholic layover that colonialism enforced on top and I think that really fascinated me because there are so many things in Filipino culture that are so unique and like the saints culture of the philippines is really intense because we that pantheon of gods is like in our blood and so for us well that's a saint right. <laughs> all those gods that's a saint now that's mother mary we'll go to her for that yeah um so for me it was really a fascinating way of of showing how in everyday life how despite the fact that you know you're forced to be catholic or at that time like you know the friars had all the power and and that was what was happening like the culture of the philippines and the beliefs of the people are still like still there even even all these centuries later um awesome. so yeah that's kind of where that came from <laughs> very cool um and you know we've talked a lot about representation um, but we haven't touched on your journey writing the book, really. I mean, we talked about research, we talked about all of these things. Um, but what was perhaps the biggest victory and the biggest learning, both, um, over the process of writing your debut novel? Absolutely. Um, so I think for me, the biggest point where I realized that maybe this book was going to make it was getting into Pitch Wars. Um, it's a mentorship program that... Uh, is no longer running, but for many years, Pitch Wars was a program that selected um, debut, uh, authors who have not been published, unpublished authors, and paired you with a published author as your mentor. And um, I was paired with uh, Mitch Dominici, who was an amazing um, Filipina author, just like me. And, and she saw that, you know, what I was writing and, and really resonated with it. And I worked with her over, two or three months. I can't remember now what the timeline was. Um, <laughs> it's been a little bit. I was in the Pitch Wars 2020-2021 uh, class, and we did a huge overhaul of the book. The book would not be what it is without um, my mentor and her seeing how much potential there was in the story. Um, so with her help, we totally overhauled it. And um, after that, I re-went into the query trenches with basically 
a 90% rewritten book. Oh, wow. um, and, and from there, I was able to get my agent and then the offer uh, with very few changes, actually. Um, there were no, there was no, I didn't do revisions before going on sub. I didn't do revisions um, before it was picked up by an editor. So really Pitch Wars made the book what it is. And my mentor, who was just really invaluable to me. Amazing. Super. Yeah, that's, I love hearing about this because for some people, querying is the hardest part. Pitching is the hardest part. Getting the agent is the hardest part. And then for some others, it kind of flows. And it's amazing to hear about these opportunities. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't say it flows. flows. I wouldn't definitely flows. was querying yeah. for the last, uh, since 2018. So I have been querying oh, many oh books for a long time. Wow. However, wow, that is <laughs> when I finally got all the pieces into place, um, eventually it did all work out. <laughs> That's that, that is impressive. I I like hearing the years, like how long it takes, because it gives you a big perspective on like the most successful authors, and even those who are starting out, they go through the same experience with like I mean almost every book. It's like you're you're going through the same querying, same finding an author. Fi I'm sorry, finding an agent, getting published. Um, and and what's the big message that you hope that folks take away from 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 your book? Hmm. I can, I, think, I can tailor it to kids. I'll say, what do you think? What do you hope that, I know this is not aimed at kids necessarily, um, but, but younger readers. What I hope that younger readers take away is that however like oddball that, that you feel and how like there's no one else like you in your world, like your perspective is important. And, and I feel that I want those sorts of readers to see themselves in these more diverse books and think, okay, there are people out there like me, even if, you know, I'm so, so different from the traditional narrative that I see on the TV, that I see in most American media, I exist and my feelings and feeling misunderstood and feeling like there's no place for me in the world are valid. And, and also that there's a community out there. Um, and it may take you a long time to find that community because, you know, when we grow up, we're wherever our families choose to be that's where we are but for me getting online getting in more involved with my community um that internationally that you can reach with online spaces was was eye-opening for me and and really changed my life so you know i hope that kids who are feeling really isolated and like no one will understand them you're gonna find those people and I think that representation in literature also helps with that, finding your place. Like there are certain books even I can think of uh, that are like, yeah, that that is that is a character that's like me, as opposed to growing up reading all white characters or, you know, even Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, when once you get past that and actually see the representation, there's a there's a separate kind of high you get from that. So totally. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And just to close off, looking into the future, I noticed this project, uh, One Half a Dead Witch, uh, and it's it's uh, set in Houston, Texas. I read is also headquartered in Houston. So I thought that uh, I'd ask you, is there anything you can tell us about, about that work in progress, um, when we might be able to see it, anything that's going on with it? Absolutely. So um, One Half a Dead Witch is my spinoff from my short story, uh, Dying Rivers and Broken Hearts, um, which is can be uh, listened to or read on Podcastle for free. So if anyone's interested, check that out. Um, it's about a Filipino witch saving the dying um, Laho of uh, the dragon of uh, Pisig River. Hmm. So One Half a Dead Witch is about that main character's great grandchildren. Um, it's it's about immigration. It's about finding your place in these diaspora communities. Um, it's kind of about finding your own magic again after something really traumatic happens. Hmm. So what's going on with that? Right now, that's kind of the only young adult work I have. Um, I'm working on revising it kind of to better fit. Um, I wrote the draft of the novel before the short story, actually. So I'm kind of revising it to better fit my timelines there. 
Um, but kind of that's my plan for the next thing um, for my agent to focus on uh, hopefully selling potentially. Um, I did sell Saints of Storm and Sorrow as a duology. So of course, contractually, my very next thing that I'm working on is Saints of Storm and Sorrow book two, um, <laughs> untitled as of yet. So that is obviously taking front seat, but um, back seat, I do have that completed manuscript that needs a big revision um, that I'd like to go out next. One of my big goals as an author, um, I'd like to be cross genre and cross age groups. Um, I really don't want to be pigeonholed as just one thing, as just the epic fantasy writer. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I really have really diverse ideas kind of all over the place and I love the chance to get those out in the world. So, um, so yeah, One Half a Dead Witch is going to be my uh, attempt at contemporary young adult fantasy. We'll see. Very, very cool. And I love that, the kind of the genre bending and and even age group, uh, the transcending even the whole age group thing. I feel like even this book, I mean, teens can read it, get something out of it. Um, I mean, every, it everyone- It is an adult book. I I will okay. preface with that. Awesome. <laughs> but no, like was, upper, was... teens, upper teens, upper definitely teens, definitely there's yeah. some crossover potential there. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, I mean, all your work is amazing. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Of course. Thank you so much, Miss Booba, for chatting with me here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. So folks, keep an eye out for Saints of Storm and Sorrow. You can pre-order it now in the UK. The US link is coming soon. By the time we upload this video, it might be there. So check the description. You can reach out to her via you can reach out to Miss Booba via social media, which is right now on the screen, or via her website, GabriellaBooba.com. I'm Ishan Mani, president of the iWrite Youth Club, signing off. Look forward to seeing you in the next interview. Bye.